Oh, excellent. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us as we jump on the stage of the Career Village at the virtual version of the Diana Initiative 2020. So now, is it just me, or does it seem as though you can't attend any event this year without everyone waxing on about the millions of InfoSec jobs that will go unfilled over the next several years due to a shortage of skilled candidates? But the thing is, you hear that all the time because it's true. Mm -hmm. Everyone, including ISC Squared, the Hershevec Group, Microsoft, and many others have published similar results from their own independent studies. It's so prevalent that huge numbers of people are rushing into the industry, even from non-IT fields and from various backgrounds, ages, levels of experience, and geographic regions. And as we may know, joining a new crowd, especially one filled with hackers, ooh. Okay, well, all joking aside, it can truly be daunting, intimidating, and in a word, strange. So I have but one question for all of you before we begin. Are you ready to turn and face the strange? Well, hello, everybody. I'm Don. I'm from eLearn Security, the sponsor of this year's Career Village, and I welcome you to ch 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 changes And forgive my voice there, but we are here to present to you a cybersecurity career panel discussion. So to help you face the strange and get your career change on track, we have three panelists to help you today. So let's go ahead and meet them. And of course, instead of hearing me continue to talk or God forbid, sing some more. Um, let's get to the stars for today. So you can see their names, their titles, and their Twitter handles on the screen, but it's probably best to hear from them yourselves. So, Ping, welcome. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, thanks, Don. Uh, my name is Ping Look, and I am currently the Senior Director for the Detection Response Team here at Microsoft. Uh, my team is the uh, only customer-facing incident response team here at Microsoft. Uh, before this, I was 13 years at Black Hat, 10 years at DEF CON. I spent a couple of years with Acupont Labs, which is now known as Optive Security. I've held many, many different roles when I was at Black Hat as the event director. Uh, when I was at Acupont, I ran the Boneville Research Team. And I never thought I would ever come and work at Microsoft, even though I was born and raised in Seattle. Uh, but here I am now, two years in. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, hey, Sarah, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, hello. Um, so I am the Director of Talent Development at ISC. Um, I am our resident people and HR nerd, making sure our folks uh, here are, are happy at ISC and they're always learning and growing and being challenged. I also do all of our recruiting. Um, ISC hosts the IoT Village. So I go looking for talent at conferences across the US and the world from, you know, with help uh, from our partners like eLearn Security. And, you know, people are what make a company successful. So. I make sure that we find the right folks and that they are thriving and they're just loving what they're doing. Awesome. And of course, the jolt of energy for our presentation today, we have Carlotta. Oh boy, I, I don't know, I'm a little run down after six, eight hours in Career Village. Hello, I'm Carlotta. Um, I am at the moment a part-time CISO for a nonprofit in Atlanta that serves primarily the um, library, museum and archive space. I have for the last, three years, run my own consulting company where I either do CTO, CIO work for, and now VCSO work for small orgs, or I do knowledge strategy for security teams. And that means that I make sure that they learn to collaborate, have a good work culture, that sort of thing. So I split my time between serving security teams and making them more human, or serving human teams and making them more secure. Excellent. So now that we know our panelists, let's get to know them actually a little more. So probably the first question, which is a good place to start off today, is how did each of you uh, start your career in security? Because as we know, not everyone starts in that direction, but that's where we all happen to be at the moment. So Ping, maybe you can take the stage first. Oh, I am a, not a technical practitioner, and by no means will I ever say that I've uh, ever served as a technical consultant, although I've run many teams of people who are deeply technical. I actually graduated with an art history degree. I worked as a graphic designer. Uh, when Black Hat and Defcon became one of my customers, at the time I was designing trade show booths and doing a lot of marketing advertising work, I discovered 
that what I was really good at, it's something I'm still very good at, is uh, people and processes, right? And as DEF CON and Black Hat grew, they really needed someone to get them more organized, to mm-hmm. facilitate relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and after spending you know, quite a bit of time there, um, it, the same skills that you have in uh, bringing people together translate across many different industries. I love security. It was like the up and coming, right? We were mm-hmm. on the cutting edge, all the new things all the time. So I was very fortunate enough to go and work at labs. Um, and I've been around enough to really deeply understand security vernacular and tech and technology. Um, and so here I am still working in security. It's really fascinating, really exciting. Well, and that, that is fascinating because in the previous talk, there was a question at the end of the presentation that asked about, well, I don't have a cybersecurity or any kind of STEM degree. Is that going to hurt me in the future? And just time and time again, not only are we hearing that so many people don't come from that particular background, Mm -hmm. but as we had discussed earlier in the career village this morning, Carlotta, Mm -hmm. there are a lot of companies that don't even require a degree anymore. Microsoft, Google, uh, several companies that are like that now. So Mm -hmm. don't let that stop you. If there's something that you want, you go for it. So Sarah, a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, so I am also not in tech. Uh, I don't have a tech background because I'm, a, as I say, self-proclaimed HR nerd, um, which is a position that I think everybody just accidentally falls into. HR is not one of those things when you're a little little girl uh, growing up back in Pennsylvania. I wasn't like, I'm going to grow up and be a human resource specialist. Uh, wasn't on my wasn't on my list. Um, but I started 15 years ago as a junior recruiter in the IT space. Um, then in in 2009, we had the Great Recession. And I lost my job and I thought, I need to get out. I want to, I need to get out of, of IT staffing because that's not a secure place, secure place. No. Um, but I ended up back in it um, at Experius IT Solutions. And turns out I ended up being there for, for 10 years, a job I was reluctant to take, um, which I'll talk about more later. Um, but uh, I ended up there for t- uh, 10 years supporting um, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Then I moved on to supporting Hewlett Packard and then Microsoft for a little bit uh, before I came to ISC. So I made it made it huge circle because um, we're located in Baltimore. But I, I left Baltimore, came full circle, and now I'm back here 10 years later. Nice. Excellent. Carlotta, you are next. Uh, I am probably the closest to hands-on technical uh, (laughs) today. I tried my hand at being a sysadmin back in the early mid nineties. I did my studied for the CCNA, looked at being a network engineer, Uh, really didn't enjoy those like very capable. I just didn't like it. Right. And uh, tried my hand at a little bit of development. And one day some artists, I had a lot of artist friends and they're like, Oh, I'd love to have a website, but IBM charges $5,000 a page. And I'm like, it can't be that hard. So I ended up in web development and that's how I put myself through school. My undergrad degree is actually in chemistry. Uh, and I was a research chemist for uh, Cotton Incorporated for several, for several months. Um, but I found myself networking all of the lab equipment to automatically dump data into a database. <laughs> and I thought, I'm in the wrong business. So at that point, I switched and I became a business analyst, um, helping a small team develop uh, large scale content management systems that would house hundreds of thousands of assets. And from there, I kind of grew into enterprise architecture management. And I I found I had a knack for making support teams actually communicate. I ended up as a knowledge manager uh, in a a startup many years ago. And I that put me on a knowledge strategy um, road. And what knowledge strategy is, and you're gonna hear this a lot in security, it's aligning people, processes, and technology to optimize for business outcomes. And as I tried to figure out where I could bring my strategy roles, uh, strategy experience into security, I realized CISOs align you know, people, processes, <laughs> and technology for security outcomes. And I had already been working at that point uh, for several years with a a security vendor. Um, And so I launched my own company and here I am now. Awesome. Okay, so let's play out a scenario if you don't mind. As it just so happens, we have representatives on the panel today from the three main phases of hiring. 
So Carlotta, as a CISO mm -hmm. or virtual CISO, helps determine those big picture needs and uh, trying to help those companies get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. Sarah, being the HR nerd that she is in creating job descriptions, promoting them, getting candidates, retaining uh, talent. And then, of course, there's Ping being a senior director and making those final decisions for membership on her team. So let's go one by one and go through the actual hiring process and get a glimpse kind of behind the scenes to hopefully offer some helpful hints for all of you who are looking to get into InfoSec. So let's start with Carlotta. So Carlotta, just your thoughts on the hiring process, on putting together a security program, what you're looking for when it comes to not only those outcomes, but the individuals to make those outcomes happen. Absolutely. And one of the reasons that I love con uh, conferences like this is that I get to meet all kinds of people who are coming from very diverse backgrounds. I tend to look very much for the person. Uh, I'm, I'm serving, like I said, my main client uh, has VC, so I'm serving a, a nonprofit. Uh, nonprofits don't pay as well, but they're a lot more flexible in terms of you understand our space and you understand security so you can communicate with us. So that's a really great way to, to get people into security. And it's, it's, a, it's a lot more generous with the learning curve as well. Uh, so I'm very much about looking at the people and how they're going to fit with the client and much more about the, the culture, the person, getting that soft skills because I know that the, the client is willing to, to invest the time to let that person and train. Awesome. As a quick follow-up, um, how many times in your experience, either with your current position or others, have you had to actually create a brand new department or just uh, expand on a current department and maybe the different challenges between the two? Oh, that's a really good question. I tend to create brand new departments because that's what I love doing. Um, Previously, my shtick is almost more uh, turnaround situations. You have, a, especially in support organizations and deeply technical companies with deeply technical uh, uh, customers, uh, support can go sideways very quick. And my my shtick was to come in and make it better because a lot of those situations, I could literally do nothing wrong. <laughs> Anything I would do would improve that situation. Uh, so it's only recently that I start actually getting to open the team myself. Um, and it, did that answer your question, Don? Because uh, I've lost the, the thread. I'm so tired. <laughs> no, no, it's totally cool. We were just kind of comparing, um, yeah. or at least the thought process was, yeah. let's compare what would uh, make you determine whether you're just going to supplement something that they're already doing or just right. say, you know what, you have nothing. We need to create it from scratch or right. blow it all up and start from scratch start from the beginning? Well, and that's, I think it's a question of where they are in their maturity model, right? Um, my current client is a great example. They've got deeply technical people who are very passionate about, passionate about serving their communities. And some of those communities are open source communities. So they're already doing a lot of the security tasks correctly. They're just not communicating. So for them, I'm saying you need one person that will, will act has the glue for these multiple different, it will be the hub for these different wheels that are turning and make sure that that gives visibility to the execs and to the board of directors. Um, for a lot of situations, it, usually you're coming in, I would say, even if I'm taking the client from zero to one, I like to say I'm, I'm the VC so that takes you from not knowing anything about security to actually knowing something about security. My buddy, Chris Roberts, a lot of people know him. He is the, the VC so that security startups hire. That is, that's not my space. I'm trying to get that basic first step. They're usually ideally already doing some of those things. It's very rare when some tech person hasn't stepped up and said, you know, we're doing it wrong. Excellent. And maybe that's something we can come back to in a little while is that when you are not only getting into a career, but then you're advancing in that, mm -hmm. you actually have a lot of choices as to yeah. where you go. Are you going to work for a company? Are you going to be independent? And if you are independent, what types of clients do you actually prefer to work with? So, mm -hmm. but that being said, so Sarah, Somebody like Carlotta will come into a company and say, hey, we either need to start from scratch or we need to start hiring some people. So she'll start talking to managers and then all of them start talking to you and say, OK, go. So how do you do that? How do you take their desires and turn it into the proper job descriptions in order to get them what they need? So, I mean, obviously, first, you're going to start with budgets and, and find out where you're at. But also, like Carlotta said, you you need to know the maturity of the company and where they're at. Do they have any senior level people? And 
you know, kind of figure out what they have and where people can move around. Uh, I mean, certainly, and I don't know if Carlotta would advise this, but I would think if you could take people that already know the product and they already know the company and sort of that mm -hmm. culture, if you mm -hmm. can move somebody over mm -hmm. to start that department, I think that's going to, that's going to be key. Yeah, and I, yeah. if you don't, if you start them a, a brand new outsider into the company, I think that would be really tough. Um, but once you have somebody that is senior, that knows the vision, that knows the culture and knows all these, these big picture things of where you want it to go, then you kind of decide, especially with budget and especially with a small growing company, um, you have to decide, am I going to spend a, a more money getting someone who really knows what they're doing or can I bring in some folks that that can be trained up and that are hungry? Um, that's what we do at ISE for the most part, um, mm -hmm. to bring in someone that has this very wide range of skills, um, isn't too focused on one path. Um, but you know, they can, they can grow. We, you know, maybe an aptitude higher, you know, someone who is just really going to learn and then we can move them around to where, where they're needed. So I think, you know, someone who is flexible, not, not too rigid might be the direction you want to go, um, and just train people in your culture, your, um, security, uh, protocols and sort of bring them up the way they, that you want. So it depends on what your what your mission is. Awesome. And a follow up for you, if you don't mind. So a lot of people are talking today, not only in the career village, but in a bunch of other different tracks uh, at the Diana Initiative about getting past that HR filter. So when you're creating these jobs and you're trying to fulfill what Carlotta's vision is, you know, or in this case, ISE's vision, how do you fill out that job description? How do you know what keywords you're looking for? What uh, level of experience that they're requiring? Salary ranges? How do you figure that all out and communicate that? And where do you communicate that? So, are you saying as as an applicant, how do I fill out that that applicant? No, I'm saying as the HR director, how do you figure out how to properly communicate in your job description or your ad what you're looking for? Yeah. So I think. You know, I, I never get the job description right on the first round. Um, <laughs> if somebody does, I definitely reach out to me later because I want to know who you are and how you do it. Um, I definitely think you, you know, you talk to a hiring manager and you get what they want and not all the time. And, and Ping might be able to speak to this. Like they, a lot of hiring managers will have these like really grand expectations mm -hmm. of what they need. And they want somebody with like 10 years of experience with all of these certs and all of this experience. And I want to pay $40,000 for it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you've got to sort of, it takes time to mm -hmm. sort of work with a hiring manager and really weed out, well, really, do they really need this? Do they really need that? And sort of this back and forth. And sometimes it, it does take hosting a job with all the the wonderful things that they want, that purple squirrel, right? Posting that job and just seeing what comes in and then showing a hiring manager, okay, here's here's what we have available. What do you think? Can we can we workshop this a little bit? Can we change it? Um, Cause this is what it's, you know, what the return is. Um, workshopping that, reposting that job position and, and seeing what you get from that. Um, but I think other ways to do it are to, um, well, it's tough when it's brand new. If you've got some people already in a position, you sit down with them, you say, what do you do? What are you working on? Um, because there's a job description and then there's what I actually do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I jokingly say that like 80% of your job falls into the uh, other duties as assigned. That's your job. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So Ping, Sarah puts the, puts it out there. She gets all these applicants. She whittles it all down. She sends you a few of them. What are you looking for? Um, how important is it between culture, technical ability, um, you know, experience, college degree, certificate? What is it that really makes people stand out for you? Because you would be the one that would make the final decision. So Great, great question because um, so many variables, right? Uh, a lot of it will really depend on what it is that we're really looking for. I always ask the question, what is it that I need to make the business further successful? 
right? So if it's a technical role, we will rely more heavily on their technical skills because if they don't, it's very difficult to bring someone up in the industry and we do take risks. I, I will admit on my team, we've taken some risks and like hired some people who really didn't have the technical skill, but we knew that there would be a long ramp. So there's a big investment in those those candidates that come to you. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, right, you, you probably are looking for someone who's got a couple of years experience at the very minimum. When it when the reality check comes down to when I have the conversation with them, because I'm not a technical person, right? They'll have gone through the technical interviews, right? Gone through the HR filter and everything like that. Um, I want to look for the red flags, right? For me, the red flags would be, I don't, I really want a very diverse set of people on my team because their job every day is to solve problems. It's to solve very complex customer crisis problems, right? And I need a lot of diversity in, in that. So I don't want someone, that, everyone that's come from, uh, one company or has exactly three to five year experience. I don't care about your college degree. People, yeah, five, 10 years ago, I have friends who were like, I really thinking about going back to school to get a college degree. I'm like, why? You're, you're doing great, right? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. great, interesting work. And, the, and, and they're like, well, I'm being held back. I think that's kind of gone by the wayside because they're experienced. And I always told them in a couple more years, your experience will trump any college degree you have because guess what? Who asks what your college degree is in unless uh, you're new out of school? And who asks what your GPA is? No one does, right? Uh, so the first thing I do is I look for the red flags. And the red flags would be, to me would be someone who I, I generally want to get to know the person, right? I want to get them relaxed and just talk. I want to know the things that they're interested in. I want to, number one, look for something that they're motivated in. A lot of people will think that the motivation has to be grand, like I wanna do charitable work, right? Something very altruistic, or that um, it has to be, you know, something specific to like, for instance, since I work at Microsoft, I've always wanted to work at Microsoft. Uh, I've always, you know, been a Microsoft fanboy and I wanna work mm -hmm. there. That's not real motivation. I just wanna find something that they're very dedicated to. Like if they have a hobby that they love and they invest in, and they spend a lot of time with where even if it's their family or their pet or whatever that's mm -hmm. showing that they're they can focus on something right they, they have something in them that you can leverage to get them to do more work right that you can talk to them about um, and that they can relate to because believe me there's a lot of people that take any job that aren't motivated another thing is when they talk about themselves do they only bring up all of the negative things I'm gonna, I, I have an HR manager, a great friend of mine, and he always advised me, he was like, no matter what we do as HR people and hiring managers, the one thing you can never account for is all the baggage from their childhood that shows up in their work life. Mm -hmm. so I listen so carefully to what are they talking about in their negatives and their positives. Um, and someone who only focuses on the positive is also a red flag because that may be someone who's not, because there's a reality check, right? Like it's great, exciting to do incident response work, but I'm like, the reality is they are long days with a customer freaking out because they're <laughs> losing millions of dollars in the stop, you know, work stoppages or can't get to their data. Are you going to be able to bear up to that burden? Right. Like, and I, 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 I want to find some reality in the person, some, some genuineness that comes out when you're just talking with them. Um, there have been times on some of the teams I've worked with when they talk to the candidate, they're like, yeah, we're going to let you talk to him, but he's not our first choice. I'm like, well, why? They're like, don't like him. I'm like, mm -hmm. because they didn't spend any time mm -hmm. to know the person. Right. And they're like, they did so bad on the, on the uh, technical interview. And I'm like, Technical mm -hmm. interviews are tough. They're in a panel and they got to like prove themselves. I would be nervous. Mm -hmm. I'm not a good test taker. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a great student, but a terrible test taker. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the things I look for are um, some genuine personality coming out when we talk, something that they're motivated by. And I don't care if it's money. I don't care if you know, I've had someone who on my team said, uh, in three years, I'm going to be you. <laughs> Director Microsoft, the <laughs> CVP, and I'm like, okay, well, um, that's adorable. That, that is adorable, and I'm not saying you can't not be done because if he were to be his own startup, he can be the CEO, <laughs> the next software, right? But uh, he's motivated. Clearly, there's something that he's going to be driven by, and I'm not going to say that's the carrot or the apple, but that's something I can try to help get him towards, right? He's got a goal he's working towards. Mm -hmm. So he's gonna work hard on my team because he believes this is a path to get there. Um, so that's 
that's like what I what I typically do. I talk to people. I try to get to know them. I try to figure out what it is that makes them tick, why it is they really want to be here. Some people very clearly, as soon as you start talking with them, you dig in. They just want to use your team as a leverage to get to another team within the company. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that, but because my team invests so heavily in um, curating and shepherding and nurturing consultants who are really good at their role, it's tough for me to hire those people because I'm going to lose them. I know eventually everyone, I'm going to lose everybody, right? Because there's some mm -hmm. opportunity that comes their way or life change. I'm okay with that. And I'm totally, if someone on my team today said, I really want to go to this other group, I love the work working for you, but I really want to go to this other group, I will do everything in my power to help them get there because that karma that comes back, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Probably I'll refer people to help me out too, but uh, it's important that my people be happy right? Happy workforce, happy customers. <laughs> so those are things that I look for. Really, it's the red flags, uh, red flags being, um, uh, I want them to be genuine. I want them to be motivated. Um, someone who constantly brings up all the past injuries is going to be tough for any employer or manager to handle. Um, and I'm not going to say they're absolute no. We just know really what we're buying, right? Like mm -hmm. this person is going to need a make sure that this culture can support that. Excellent. Carlotta, what do you see as some red flags? And then maybe so we don't focus totally on the negative. What are some positive ways to either overcome those red flags or ways that uh, people really stand out to you to say, hey, I, I want this person on my team? Uh, I think a big red flag for me is it's not just negativity. I mean, there there negativity can be a, a red flag, but sometimes you confuse realism with negativity. So I try to look a little bit past that. Uh, I think for me, a big red flag though is uh, I'm trying to to figure out how to say this. Um, this kind of resigned attitude, right? Like I, I need a job. I'm good at this or I'm good enough at this, right? It, you're not selling yourself when you're like that. Uh, there are there are a lot of folks out there who also kind of, they want that 4.0, like they're driven in the wrong way. Like I want that for, I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to get 4.0. I'm going to get this job and I'm going to, I'm going to do 90%, you know, close rate on your, your triage stuff. And it's just like, that's, I'm not looking for you to achieve a goal. I'm looking for how you think in terms of a system, right? If you're hyper-focused, if you're really good at penetration testing, that's great. But if you can't tell me why that's valuable for an entire system or for an entire company and why we should sell that, then you're, you're too focused. Your, your focus is way too narrow. Um, I want your scope and not everyone can, is a, a systems thinker or holistic thinker, but even if you're not, I want you to be able to articulate, this is my focus. I will look to you for this piece. Right. Um, what I don't want is someone who's so focused on penetration testing or on, you know, something else that, they are like the rest of the department's crap. Anything else in security is crap. Like those, those are not people I want. Those are not team players. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. All yeah. right. So, so let's get to the crux of the situation because so many people are working really hard to study and get the education and whether that's through a university or self-study getting certifications, they they're trying to tick those boxes mm -hmm. in order to get past the HR filter. So mm -hmm. Sarah, how do we do that? Because now a lot of the systems that are in place, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, are all automated. So they're looking for specific keywords or you have to actually tick those boxes or your resume doesn't get through. How do we make sure that we do that? And then in addition to that, um, yeah, sorry about the echo. I'm hearing it a little bit too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's probably because we're all on at the same time. Um, I'm seeing that in the chat. but. Um, also, maybe Sarah, you can give us some little hints on how we can avoid the HR filter and maybe make some kind of direct connection with a company or a person. So you're you're talking about the applicant tracking system, the the ATS, or as I lovingly refer to it as the black hole. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> so um, I know everybody here has heard this and said this a thousand times. So here it is for the 101st time uh, network and get referred 
is mm -hmm. is the way to go <laughs> instead of that mm -hmm. ATS. Uh, a, a resume or an introduction coming from a current employee or someone like Carlotta or Ping means so much more uh, to a recruiter. And they're basically obligated to actually open and read that resume, right? They can't say no because their colleagues sent it to them, so they have to do it. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's, that's the way to get by that filter. But inevitably, you're going to have to submit your resume to the black hole. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of things that you can do to at least ease some of the pain that goes along with that is, one, make sure that your resume is word, uh, word format or, or PDF searchable um, recruiter. And then just also make sure that that is like 100% generic. Um, they were already talking about it in the Career Village channel today. You're going to hear more people talk, talk about resumes and how to format them. I know it seems so boring to do that plain Jane standard thing, but recruiters will look at hundreds of resumes per job sometimes. They look fast. So if the information they're looking for isn't in those standard spots, they typically look for it, they move on, they go fast. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know it seems counterintuitive. You wanna do a resume that stands out and is flashy so it gets noticed but it's actually gonna get noticed in a bad way. So look for those, those standard resumes, make it that standard format. The other thing that's gonna be super helpful in that is that when you upload a standard format resume and you hit submit, what happens next? It's gonna ask you to fill out a billion fillable form <laughs> that is exactly <laughs> what is your resume, right? right You're going, right. Can I just type C resume in every yeah. one of these? C resume, C resume, C resume. You can't. But if uh, for the most part, the ATS will parse your resume. So if your resume is in that standard boring format, it's going to parse that really well. It's going to save you a lot of time. It's not going to put, you know, your college address as your home address. It's not going to put your college dates as the last job you worked, et, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it just mm -hmm. saves you a little bit of time. It's gonna populate that stuff a little bit better. And you know, that's kind of, it's kind of a numbers game in ATS, right? It's submitting to as many as you can. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that I would definitely recommend with an ATS is um, you, you really have to customize your resume for the job you're looking for. There are so many different types of jobs within security. Um, and you are probably open to many different avenues, but if you don't customize that resume for the job that you're looking for, you're, you're going to run into some roadblocks, especially, um, especially if you're new, if you've just graduated college, you're new to the job market, um, that, that objective box. It's the very first thing um, that recruiters look at, right? And if that box, if that first thing, your objective doesn't match my job, the one you applied for, I'm it's that's the first thing that you're already starting off kind of on the wrong foot because I think, well, they're either applied to my job, but their their ambitions are really over here. So we're not really going to be aligned. So customize, even if that's just to have four or five base resumes that you say for all the different avenues, save them so that you can kind of cater to the job. And then also, you know, pull up the job description for the position you want over on one screen, pull up your resume on the other and go through that job description. Mm -hmm. If you say to yourself, and I, I, people do this all the time, they go through that job description, they go, oh, I can do that. Yeah, I have that skill. Oh, yeah, I can code. I can read that code. I, and they go through the job description saying, yep, 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 yep. But it's not on their resume. Right. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Don, it does keyword matching, right? The more matches you have, the higher up the list, it will feed your resume to the recruiter. Yeah. So add those things in, um, just add them in, you know, uh, cause you, oh, you hate being in that interview. And the, the interviewer says, do you have X, Y, Z? And they, and you say, oh yeah, yeah. I did that three years ago, um, for about six months. And they go, well, it's not on your resume. Uh, that's just the worst. So look at that job description and make sure that stuff is in your resume. Um, you know, having that technical skills chart is fantastic. Populate it with all the things that you're skilled in and don't put stuff in there that you studied and did once for a week because you're not an expert in that. Take that off. 
-hmm. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, overall, we kind of know, and there's that echo again, <laughs> but we, we kind of know that a job is one of the, your, your big life decisions that you're making. And so a lot of times we want to always remind people that it's not just that you're going for a job, but this is somebody that you're going to have to be connected to for a very long time. And with that, you want to make sure that not only are you the right candidate for the job, but is the person that you're going with or the company that you're trying to apply to, are they right for you? So Ping, what are your feelings about candidates asking you questions during an interview? It's absolutely crucial. I don't want to have a one way. And I know that a lot of people have said that I am um, a very daunting person to speak to, right? Because they're like either heard I had some reputation that Black Hat is being very strict, <laughs> very nicely, or whatever rumors, right? Or they read about your CV or they saw you present and they kind of have very like deer in the headlights when they talk to you. It's really important that they come with questions because you're right. If a person is vested in or really interested in coming to your group, um, learning more about it, they're going to have questions. And that's one of the parts of the conversation. I totally get some people are very nervous. I've had people that just talked at me. One guy talked at me for three hours. I let it go for that long because he came as a referral from someone else on my team. And I sense, right, he, he wasn't trying to impress me. He was just wanted to sell himself so badly. And I, and I had the time and, and I learned a lot about him. And at first I was like, look, I, my, my, my recommendation was like, he was very nervous with me, but he passed the technical interview fine. The other three, cause I have three hiring, four managers and so three of them have to talk to whoever we're hiring. You all like him. I think he'll be fine. It, but he had a lot of questions for me too. Like where, questions that they that any candidate can ask their generic is where what are your goals in the next year for your team that you're building right what are the things that you're going to be asking me to work on I'll talk about your career as well ask them what are what are your prospects for advancing in a company smaller companies um it can be exciting because you can do many different roles but other people may want something that's more structured where you know, if you want to become a VP, you're going to need to go to a much larger company that can support you moving and growing and learning those skills. I had a girlfriend, uh, five years industry experience, great person. She had been an intern with us at Black Hat. She was like, hey, I'm thinking I really want a CISO role. And I'm thinking to myself, you don't have the experience to be making the decisions as a CISO for any company unless it's your own company at this point. And I was like, I don't know, but I didn't say that to her. It wasn't a lack of confidence. What I did say to her was, I want you to think about this. You as a 27 year old CISO, where does that lead you to go to your next company? Because if you try to get hired at a place like Microsoft or Amazon, that as soon as you see that on your resume, someone with very little experience trying to get to this level, they're like, I would not hire you because you don't have the body the experience to manage as a CISO at a company this large. So you have to be patient, not be tied so tied to the title. Um, but it's really important that you do come with questions because you have to express an active interest in the place that you're going. And that oftentimes does um, delineate you from other candidates. A lot of candidates will just ask the generic questions. How am I going to be paid? When are my vacation days? You know, kind of uh, more generic questions. Ask questions that show that you've research the group or the company that you're going you're interviewing at that shows you're invested I, I agree and i just want to add on like even you know i feel like that's probably one of the biggest negative feedback pieces that i get from hiring managers when they come mm -hmm. back and i do that recap after they've just interviewed someone they just say oh yeah she didn't ask me any questions right and that, and i get it because you might if by the time you're talking to the decision maker you've probably talked to the recruiter mm -hmm. maybe another team member mm -hmm. and done a technical you know so this might be mm -hmm. the fourth person you talk to even if you've actually had all of the questions you planned out in advance answered, ask them again. Right. Um, you know, yeah. different people in the organization are going to answer those questions differently. So yes. it's actually good to get that yes. different perspective. Yeah. But yeah, definitely ask them if they answered every think of more, there's mm -hmm. going to be something or just ask the same question again. And there, there are some questions that I have just kind of um, 
that I always ask. Yeah, throughout my career, I've asked. And what I look for from the answer changes depending on where I am in my career. When I'm much younger, when I was much younger in my career, my I started asking, you know, what it, can you define success in the first 90 days of this role? What, what does success look like for you? And if, when I was very junior, I was expecting them to have an idea of success in their head, right? But now that I'm very senior, if I ask that question and they have a very specific idea, they're looking for someone more junior than me, right? So the right answer at, at this stage in my career is, you know, I'm hiring somebody who's smart and good at this. I want them to come in and set that measure. Uh, the other thing is whether you're talking to a manager or talking to a peer or potential peer or a potential internal customer, a really great question is, uh, how do you see working with this role? What does this role make easier for you, right? And that's a really great question because if they don't have an answer for it, they don't know what you're supposed to be doing. And that's gonna be a very hard job to walk into, right? If you if you have a couple of people who are like, oh yeah, I need you to do, I, I need to work with this world this way, that's great. Um, but if pretty much everyone's like, we need a project manager, I don't know, you know, then you, you have to decide whether you have the spine to go in there and set it, right? Um, and some people do and some people don't. I am somebody, if you give me an inch and make it kind of vague, I am gonna make it my way, right? And I'm gonna be really happy with that. Um, but there are a lot of people out there who want a little more structure, who want a little more certainty ro rolling in, right? So that's, that's the kind of questions that I would ask. Well, speaking of questions, I know it's important to ask questions when you're in the interview, but probably even more important is asking yourself the difficult questions. So if you guys each had one question that you think a candidate should ask themselves and be prepared for, mm -hmm. what would it be? Because I know one of them that I think of right off the bat is, you know, either where do you see yourself in five years or what kind of value can you bring to the company? And people go, uh, wow, you know, I never even thought about that. Mm -hmm. So what are some things that they should actually think of to ask themselves before they even show up? And anybody can take that one. So I don't know if this is exactly the, the question, Don, but one question that you're almost always going to get when you go into a company is, tell me about your flaws or your shortcomings or tell me where you're weak. And I think, while I don't know if that's the most important question, it always gets asked. And yeah, people so, say, uh, I work too hard. I, <laughs> <laughs> I dedicate too much. I care too much. I'm exactly. Too much. Yeah. And in my first job, I definitely did that, right? Like, mm -hmm, people are going to ask me a bizarre behavioral thing. question. They're going to ask me what my weaknesses are. And I'm going <laughs> to take a really good thing and I make it sound bad. Like, I'm too organized. Uh, I spend too much time organizing and that, that can be a waste of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guilty. Mm -hmm. um, but and that more realistically, I, it should be something like I, I'm too soft when my kids want something. <laughs> but I really do think even though that doesn't sound like a big deal question, it's like Ping said, you look for people to be genuine. Mm -hmm. And when you do something like that, it is it, they see right through it. They see yeah. exactly what you're doing. And yeah. a, a, again, like what Ping said, you, we look for people that have drive and ambition. And when you can say, I don't know how to do X, Y, Z very well, but mm -hmm. I'm willing to learn it, mm -hmm. right? That yeah. is what is super important, right? We look for candidates that have that drive, um, and sort of are a forever student, right? Ambition and, and the desire to learn go hand in hand. So regardless of what level you are at, you need to be wanting to get to that next level, willing to grow. No matter how much experience you have, you should know that you don't know everything, right. especially yeah. in IT. Right. Yeah, right. lifelong learning is crucial in IT and even more so in InfoSec. Yes, yes. yes. So even so if Carly you have... 10 years under your belt, you should also be willing to say, I can learn from an intern, you know? Yep. And so I think that that is really important. So when you get that question, everybody's going to ask you that question. So know how to answer it genuinely. Yeah. A little bit of self-awareness goes really far right there. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's go on to this one real quick, if you guys don't mind, because I'm looking at the time. Mm -hmm. So I want to just go to maybe uh, one or two pieces of advice that you would want to give somebody that maybe we haven't even touched on today. So Carlotta, you want to go first? Oh, boy. Uh, research. They can even harken back. Oh, yeah, I was say, even harken back to something maybe we talked about during the career village. Well, yeah, I mean, a part of it is that just research, know what you want, like, and and that's the problem is that is that there's so much out there, and when you're looking for your first job, you want to take any job, right? But if you can articulate why you want my job, then I'm I'm more likely to listen to you, and maybe it's I want to work for the sport org of this uh, security vendor because I want to understand what other roles there are and I want to grow into another role in three to five years. Like that's going to get a much better response for me than somebody who doesn't know what they want to do. How I want to do it because I want to be in security is not the best answer. Excellent. Ping? Um, I would always say be very honest. Mm -hmm. 100%. When being asked a question, do not pat it. There's a difference between confidence and confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing I always caution is be honest, because if you are not honest and it gets found out after you get hired or as a part of the hiring process, that is a nope. It's you're breaking the trust immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and if they find out a little, you know, don't lie and say you have 10 years Python coding when you have 10 months or 10 hours, <laughs> because you, I mean, people say, do whatever it takes to get your foot in the door. But if you, if it's a lie that's going to be discovered right away, uh, it's going to really hurt you because they will not be able to recommend, I would not be able to recommend this person for another role. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to, um, you know, it's hard to build, rebuild that trust with the teammates when they're being let down because the person's not able to do their job because they sounded good. They looked mm -hmm. good. Uh, but they weren't honest. So honesty is always a big thing and practicing that even actively every day once you're hired is really important. And if it's honestly not working out for you, the role, I, you know, would always advise go to the person, tell them, you know, you want some time. There's so much friction. It's just not working. Maybe they can help figure out a way to make it more successful for you, or maybe they'll help you find another role where you can be successful. So honesty is number one for my book. Excellent, Sarah. All right, so I, I have two pieces of advice if you're you're new to the job market, maybe you just graduated, um, you're on the job market for the first time. One is add your CTFs, your volunteer work, your labs, your competitions, any any of your personal projects to your resume. Um, it doesn't need to be only professional experiences or official or internships. Um, if you're worried about your resume being more than one page, um, you know, put it in a get repository, um, build out your LinkedIn, get all that information in there. Um, we don't look at paper resumes anymore. So if you put sure. that link at sure. the top of your resume, we're going to click it and you can get all sorts of great information in there. We can really see your personality and your LinkedIn and your Git and everything. Design it for a non-technical person like me so that I can follow along. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing I would say to, to folks that are new it's really daunting right now. Um, we are officially in a recession. The market is flooded with applicants. It's mm -hmm. it's so scary, um, but don't be scared. Uh, we did this in 2001. I told you I lost my job in, in 2009 because of the great recession. Mm -hmm. We survived it then and we will we'll get through this this time as well. Um, so just be aware, there's a couple of things that you should know you you might end up in a job that you kind of have to settle for to pay mm -hmm. the bills it, it it's going to happen mm -hmm. um you may end up in a career that you never expected though so so be open i wanted to get out of it and i got i got sucked more into it and then my career developed and i didn't even want to take the job but i did it reluctantly like I said, to pay the bills. Right. Um, but on that note, sometimes when you, you do take it reluctant, go in with an open mind. What can I learn from this? Okay, I'm settling for something just because they've made me a reasonable offer and they seem nice enough and I'll go work for them. Now, now you need to really figure out what you can learn from that. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, you may, and actually, I'm not even going to say may, you are definitely at some point in your career going to be in a job you don't like. It happens. It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Just 
to mm-hmm. keep at it. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of like reluctantly taking something, it's like, I would say you can't work for a company that you don't believe in what they do big Mm -hmm. picture, right? Mm -hmm. But you can work for a company in a job you don't like, as long as the company is doing the right things. So Mm -hmm. just, yeah, kind of be aware. Like when you think about, well, can I take this job? It's not what I wanted, but can I take it? Just think about really what the company does in the big picture and what their morals are. And if they fall in line with how you feel and how you live your life, that's really Mm -hmm. important. Um, But, you know, just be patient. Um, You know, if you are honest, like Ping said, if you make that honest effort, you are hardworking, Mm -hmm. that effort comes back to you. Um, It might take a long time to see the fruits of your labor, but hang in there. Try not to be discouraged. It does get hard when you you are pushing into that ATS day after day and you get that rejection email, Mm -hmm. that rejection, that automated, it's not even personal, right? You just get that on it. It's really easy to get back bogged down and get, go be hard on yourself. It's not you. It's it's a process. It it takes a long time to get through it, but I know it's discouraging, but uh, you'll get through it. So hang in there. Awesome. Well, on those words of wisdom, we're going to advance just a little bit um, and let you know that we wanted to at least mention quickly that you should really check out the Career Village page at dianainitiative.com, uh, where you can, or I'm sorry, .org, <laughs> where you will find some helpful resources like what you see on your screen now and some hot job listings from other TDI sponsors. And we hope that everything inspired all of you today. However, we know that we can't address everything in such a short amount of time. So we invite you to join us over in the Career Village. It's just a couple clicks away, where we'd be more than happy to answer all of your questions over the next two days. We'll also have resume reviews, uh, help on interviews, career advice, impromptu talks, and much more. We've actually had this morning several attendees turn on their own cameras and join in on the fun. So it's completely interactive, uh, very educational, and honestly, just a, a ton of fun. So we can even help guide you on how to get that hands-on practical skill that you need in order to make that career change. Because, well, shockingly enough, that's what we do at eLearn Security. Also, as you may have seen, we're giving away some prizes. So if you head over to the Career Village and click the pinned link to the Google form, you can add your name and email address to be entered to win one of four prizes, which is actually your choice of an elite edition of any eLearn security course. So you'll get the full experience with slides, videos, dedicated labs, and the certification exam. We'll be giving away two today and two tomorrow. However, if you don't win, well, don't worry, we still got you covered because uh, from now until the end of the month, we're offering a special discount code specifically for the Diana Initiative. So with with the code TDI-035, let me go back there. Um, you'll actually get 35% off of our entire catalog of red and blue team courses and certifications that go along with those courses. For more details, be sure to head on over to the eLearn Security Virtual booth. We'll have staff on hand to help you in any way that they can. So that's enough for the sales pitch. So thank you so much to the Diana Initiative, our panelists, and of course, all of you for attending. We'll see you in the Career Village. Until then, happy hacking. But before I let you go, I was told that there's nothing going on after this particular talk. So we have a few more minutes. So I had some follow-up questions for each of you, if you guys don't mind. Does that sound okay? Sure. Sure. Awesome. All right. So Carlotta, we talked earlier about choosing your own clients. So could you maybe talk more about some of the thought process behind creating your own career path and making that Ooh. happen. Yeah, that's, that's a I mean, really easier said done, but yeah, I'm still working on it. Right. Uh, uh, when I, when I left the last, the corporate gig, the major security vendor, uh, I was very fortunate that I had built an incredible security related network. So my first few contracts were with people who had at one point been in my chain of command or had been management and that corporate vendor that went on to do other startups. And so they would call me and say, hey, Carlotta, can you do the things, can you come in and look at this and set this up in a way in terms of content management and collaboration to prevent the problems that you were paid to solve 
at that major vendor, right? Um, and, and that was that's very much about the relationship. That's very much about your work speaking for itself. Um, a lot of my clients have worked with me in some capacity. My favorite client, the nonprofit, um, I worked with on my capstones and my masters. And when I decided to to bite the bullet and do that VCSO role for them, even though I've never been a VCSO, I've been a VCIO and I've got lots of programmatic experience and I certainly knew more about security than they did. Um, but it's that trust relationship, right? Uh, they believed that I was capable of leading them, of guiding them through that process. And that's really important. Uh, so for me, those career changes were very much about the relationships that I had built, which is why when I try to uh, connect people with roles and companies that maybe I don't even work with directly, uh, I, I do leverage my network excessively to, to say, hey, I've met this really fantastic person at this, at this career village at TBI. Um, I think they'd be a great fit for you. If you have anything, reach out to them, right? I'm very much about the using my relationship and my experience to help other people. And especially uh, Michelle B had 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 a question about, you know, it's really hard. It's really hard for black and indigenous people to, to break into any tech or security role. Uh, and it's important that that people, and I'm half Filipino, so I, I can't claim to have the same experience because I'm white enough um, in a lot of situations, uh, but I am in the South, so sometimes I'm not, right? <laughs> so, uh, but it's especially important that I use my relationships that I've built to help to help black women and black men and indigenous people break into places where I feel like they they would be valued, right? So that's that's a lot of, of what I do now. Awesome. And one thing that I could actually offer is never be afraid to be an advocate for yourself. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because uh, I I'm a I'm a single stay at home dad of two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my my son was classified as special needs several years ago, and my mom actually lives with us as well. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain jobs that I can't do, certain tasks that I can't accomplish because of that, because that is higher on my personal priority list. Right. And when going in for jobs, I had to refuse jobs because I put that as my priority. And as Ping said, I was honest. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't honest, yeah, maybe I would have gotten the job, but it would have hurt us and them in the long run. Right. I would have uh, you know, lost that trust with the company. And then when I had to tell them no, it would have caused a big uh, commotion. But bottom line is then I may have to go do something that would take me away from what I felt was my priority. So that would be my one, my one thing is mm -hmm. advocate for yourself. Um, yeah. Uh, and hold true to your integrity, to your core ethics. I've I've certainly told companies of flat out. I've told managers like, if you want me to do that, then uh, I'm out this afternoon. You can hire somebody else on Monday. I won't do that. Let me explain integrity to you. I have used those words. So, uh, and as we discussed earlier, Don, I grew up very poor. And in my case, and, and as you've said earlier in the career village, some of us who grew up very poor become very, like my brother, he wants very stable, he wants a steady paycheck, he's, he's not, he's a little fearful, so he doesn't grow as much and he doesn't reach his potential. I am very fortunate, I don't have anyone, well, at the time, early in my career, I didn't have anyone relying on me. So I, okay, I'll eat ramen for a few months until I find the role that's right for me. Um, so I was not afraid to literally couch surf and be homeless and eat ramen for a few months, six months, even a year sometimes, while I kind of held true to, to my own core values. Nice. So well, I want to follow up. Oh, I was going to actually say, I have some separate follow-up questions for each one of you, but mm -hmm. I know this is an okay. important topic. So each of you, please feel free to add on to what you just heard. So for Carlotta, I, I love that she, you know, we talk about advocating for yourself because um, number one is be a good advocate as in whatever you post on social media, it's mm -hmm. going to follow you forever. Mm -hmm. And there are employers that will search mm -hmm. that. So be very careful what you're posting. Absolutely. Good mm -hmm. point. The other, the other thing is that when the offer comes, right, we've talked about how to get your foot in the door, you know, things during the interview. Think about what it is that you really want and what it is that you really need. And I'm going to speak very specifically about salary, okay, mm -hmm. because – there are a lot of play people who are like, I want a quarter of a million dollars. Or half a million dollars. I am two years out of college. I mean, this followed me even when I was a designer. Everyone thought they're gonna be millionaires like the first year out. They're gonna work right at some I'm becoming a creative director, right? Like, okay. 
think about what it is that you really need to make your ends meet. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what it is you want, and you have to be very honest again with yourself and advocate. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I need an additional five thousand dollars because I cannot meet my household, you know, expenses because you're here. It is this the the dream job, but it it's not paying enough. Don't mm -hmm. go in there thinking once you get in here, I'm going to prove to them they're going to be able to. There are budget constraints. There are mm -hmm. political politics that go in there. Um, yeah. If you need to make fifty thousand dollars and they're offering you forty two, ask for the fifty, right? And and just be honest about it. And it's the same when you go to to ask, you know, if you feel you've been passed over, have a conversation about, you know, I, I thought I was being considered for the promotion for the role. I want to talk about, you know, why it was I was passed over so that I can improve. Mm -hmm. Um, but advocate for yourself. Don't be afraid. Some people especially I find with women and, and we interview so many more men than women just because of the disparity in, in gender in the industry. We women are like, we have to have all the check marks or I won't in interview for the role. Cause I've had people, I'm like, why didn't you apply? Mm -hmm. I can't talk to you unless you apply. <laughs> and they're like, I didn't meet all the things. And I'm like, well, that guy had like three of the seven hopeful things. <laughs> right. To have, right. Right? right. But he talked the game. That was the confidence. Mm -hmm. But I said, mm -hmm. but you're far more confident our operator than that person is. Right. right. And right. so just be honest and advocate for yourself. If yeah. there is a role that you really want to pursue, no mm -hmm. one can consider that resume unless you send it in. And then mm -hmm. when you have an offer in front of you, be very honest. Yes. It's nice to always make more money or have a hundred vacation days versus 10. Mm -hmm. What is it that you need? versus what it is that you want and can you compromise to get there? Negotiate, that, that's your next, the next thing is the art of the negotiation, but that's a, that's a whole different issue. Sarah, I saw you nodding a lot. Do you have something to add to that? You know, so I was going to say the same, the same thing as Ping, where that the whole like, oh, I only have nine out of 10, so I'm not going to apply. And you've, you've got the gentleman over here who has <laughs> one out of 10 and I, right. he still applies. And I think that is probably a, a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's not so far from the truth. Yeah. Um, so what you really do need to do is look at yourself and go, well, I only have, you know, maybe eight or nine out of the 10 things, but I've also got five or 10 other things that aren't even on this list and I can use those to supplement and do great things for this company. So convince yourself, mm -hmm. talk to yourself about the other great things that you do have that supplement those shortcomings and you can actually help and do things for that company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once you have a few years under your belt, it, it definitely changes your confidence. But mm -hmm. one thing I always do before I go into a job interview is I get on Glassdoor and I look at all the reviews and I look at what all the people, all the negative things that are mm -hmm. on there, right? Mm -hmm. I look at what problems a company, if you can, can, if you can assess some of the problems a company is having and you mm -hmm. can walk into that interview and say, Hey, here's how I can help you it, it'll it'll blow them away if you can go in and say here's what i'm gonna do for you like i know this is your job description but i've got a couple more things to add for it and here's here's what i'm gonna do for you but and yeah I'm having that confidence i'm gonna jump in there on the salary bit um i i got into the habit of asking for what i wanted to make in five years uh because if they came close to it then i knew that they valued what i'm bringing um if if they matched it then if I don't get a raise for five years, that's fine, you know, and it, it works out. Uh, and the number of times that people matched it were very good. Uh, even once I had it exceeded. So absolutely. And I, and recruiters are great. I love, I love recruiters here. I really love you. Because when I worked for Netflix, <laughs> Netflix at the time paid notoriously well by Silicon Valley you know, standards. So when they made, they, they literally said to me, um, What's it going to take to get you out of this company and come work for us? And I named what I thought was an absurd number. And they went, great. Can you start on Monday? And I was like, oh, crap. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> well, when I left there, I, I you know, called recruiters when I was finally ready to go back to work. I'm, I'm very much about leaving, taking a few months off, and then looking for a job because um, I like to detox, right? Uh, when I started talking to recruiters, I was like, look, I, I know I probably won't make it what I was making at, at, at Netflix. And the recruiters, too, three out of three really? Because I think I can get you more. Right. So recruiters are your friend. Yeah. Yeah. Recruiters are your friend when they're not working for the company. Right. Yep. Yeah. 
Very cool. Well, on that positive note, um, we're a few minutes past the top of the hour, and I don't want to uh, overstay our welcome uh, with the moderators. So I will thank everyone, definitely uh, you guys for participating. But that being said, all of this was meant to encourage you, to inspire you, and join us over in the Career Village. So we will all be there. I don't know exactly what everyone's schedule is, but uh, we'll be in and out. So please feel free. We can continue this conversation over there. But I also know that we have the closing keynote coming up. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap things up and thank everybody. And we will see you in the Career Village uh, later after this talk, after the keynote, and definitely all day tomorrow. So Absolutely. we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone.